From Green Building Pro, this is Green Talk. I'm Jenica Egan, editor of the Green Building Journal. I'm talking today with Lisa Gelfand, architect and author of the book, Sustainable School Architecture, to chat about green schools. Welcome to the show, Lisa, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Oh, perfect. So just to kind of get things started, I was curious, what got you interested in green schools and motivated enough to, to write this book? Well, I think that, that uh, green architecture and green schools are, are a terrific match. So we'd been doing it on our school jobs, um, and we'd been doing it just because we thought that a lot of the things that have now become recognized as green were actually good schools. And so once we started doing that as a, as a basis of design back in the, back in the 90s, um, we, we actually felt like, isn't it great that there's now a movement that, that actually has, has, has uh, organized all these things and, and, and we'd really like to get the word out so that other people will do it as well. Great. So what are, what are some of the characteristics that make green schools different from other building types? Well, a lot of what, uh, what characterizes a school is that it's usually not just a building. And um, many of the ways that many of the sort of beginning green building um, programs such as LEED or, or even just looking at, at, at uh, sustainable homes, they all looked at the building by itself. And a school is usually a campus. So we might be looking at 10 acres on a, you know, on a suburban uh, elementary school or 40 acres on a high school. And so the land use part of it, the way that the buildings interact inside and outside, is a really huge part of school design. And that's true all across the country, even in, in very severe climates, where, where kids are still assumed to be going outside for sports or for um, other uses on the, on, the, uh, on the campus. So that's one really big difference, that, that schools are usually campuses and we can make a big impact on hydrology and, and a lot of other things um, that in a single building type you can't do. What are the green features and measures that make the most difference in, in education? Well, we looked at things like what makes a difference in a classroom? What do kids really respond to? What's different about kids? Um, schools are also used by kids who are more sensitive to toxic substances. They're more sensitive to, um, to you know, problems, contaminants in the environment. So we really want to have good indoor air. Um, studies have shown that, that in a day-lit classroom, kids will learn faster, score higher on tests. Uh, that acoustics in the classroom makes a really big difference. It certainly makes a really big difference to have the right to have not too much CO2, so that actually your kids don't come in and fall asleep after uh, after recess. Yeah. So yeah. those are all things that we we think make big differences in school environments. So for for to get energy conservation out of those, then we want to use a lot of daylighting that lets us cut down on electric lighting, which can be 40 to 60 percent of the electric load of a school building. So we really want to do that. We wanted to um, uh, site designs that let us cut down on irrigation. So things like athletic turf are just uh, huge users of irrigation. So it doesn't have to be athletic turf everywhere. And that makes for a different kind of an educational environment as well. So we can cut down on electricity. We can cut down on, on water use. We can also um, make sure that with the right kinds of screening and ventilation, we can cut down on the use of cooling. Wow. So what are some of the resources and rating systems available for schools to help uh, focus on these green design? Well, I think um, that, that LEED, the USGBC developed LEED and there's many different LEED products and there's a LEED for schools and that has begun to recognize the difference in, in, um, in what design for schools are and that just helps you organize it. You can go through the whole LEED rating system and say, what am I doing for sustainable sites? What am I doing for indoor air quality, for indoor environmental quality? And that checklist will help you. It's also connected with the Collaborative for High Performance Schools, um, which developed, it's called CHIPS, and that in California developed a high performance schools system. And that was just for schools. And that has, it, it actually has been in its second iteration um, made to be very similar to LEED so that you don't have like sort of conflicts between rating systems. But that one comes with a really terrific website, um, chips.net, and that, um, that gives you best practices manuals. So you can just get on that website and say, how do I do daylighting? How do I um, use natural ventilation? How can I make a better, um, greener school? One of the things it really recognizes is that schools usually don't have the money for some of the third, ver third party verification or other kind of systems that other building types do. So if you're working a real tight budget and you want to put all of your resources in green design into the design, 
uh, and yet make make uh, take a lot of, um, of uh, sort of um, help from from the work that's already been done. Then resources like the Chips website are really helpful. Yeah, that's really, yeah. really interesting. So, um, how much more money will it cost a school to implement these sort of green, you know, green features? Well, it's interesting. We our first green school was really, uh, as I said, it was it was a school that we had already designed, and um, the the. Uh, uh, the PG&E, the local um, utility in California, wanted to do a pilot program. So they came on board after schematics was already done with a big grant for the school district, a $500,000 grant. And that grant enabled us to do extra modeling and enabled us to do extra monitoring and so on. And it was, it was terrific. But it didn't pay for any extra uh, sort of um, elements of the design. And what happened is that the school district, after that school was built, decided to do the next six schools using the same criteria. There was no extra money. That was still the same original school bond money that had been there from the beginning. So we thought, well, you know, are we gonna be able to do it? We were able to do it with integrated design, making sure that, that green design like daylighting and fresh air were real priorities for our, for our team. And when um, some years later, when our school business officer did a, a, a comparison of the seven schools done under CHIPS and the two schools that meet California's Title 24 requirements, pretty stringent, we find that we save between twenty dollars and $50,000 per year per campus every year on utility bills for the CHIPS schools. So at this point, you know, we fully made up uh, any difference, even if they'd had to lay out the first $500,000. And as I said, the, the following schools had no extra money at all. Uh, the, there's been a Davis Langdon study of all green building types, and you can do green buildings at every price point. Um, there's some there's some idea that to go to lead silver, lead lead gold, you might be adding five percent, but it's um, it's hard to say. Is if you're using real good integrated design, and you've thought about it from the beginning in schematics, then I think that you can you can say that the entire design may not have much of a premium. Certain features cost more, controls cost more and so on, but if they let you have a smaller mechanical system, you know, maybe you can trade it off. And so what can existing schools do to implement some green features that aren't too enormously costly? Well, I think that just looking at those at, at the figures that tell you where you're using your uh, where you're using most of your energy is a real good uh, good beginning. So, if that forty to sixty percent of energy is going into uh, lighting, then the first thing to do is change the light bulbs. So many schools could just go out there and change the fluorescent lamps. Um, beyond that, you know, you're always looking into whether you're on an old boiler system. Original, the, the first many schools run on boilers that run 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So running your, uh, running your, putting new controls on your heating system so that they actually do make a, diff they, di they, they, they make a distinction between when, when uh, spaces are occupied and when they're not, that's a big help. Um, I, we find that schools, that students, teachers, that communities are really interested in making their school more green. And they'll do carpools. They'll get kids. They'll do uh, they'll do kids programs to get kids to walk and bike. And um, there was a school that I know of that got rid of plastic bags in school lunches. They had their fourth graders figure out how many plastic bags those little carrots came in, and what a huge pile it would be by the end of the year. And the classroom that got rid of the most plastic bags brought in containers. Got a visit from the principal dressed up as Container Man, and so. <laughs> There's a lot of things school communities can be very enthusiastic and just get right into it without a big expensive modernization. Mm -hmm. But certainly once that has started, once, once the school is ready to make those kinds of investments, then it should be a big priority to look at what kinds of, of improvements in energy use and in environmental health and quality can be done. And then you get a much greener campus and you get the kids learning from the beginning that this is something that will be important to them in their school campus, in their workplace, and in their homes later. Well, great. Thank you for joining me today, Lisa. And for more information on green schools, be sure to check out Lisa's book and also attend uh, the first of our Green Building Online event series on August 25th, where Lisa will be available for live Q&A following her webcast. Thank you for joining me today, Lisa, and I look forward to your participation in our Green Building Pro Online event in August. Thanks so much.